Hey, Inga. Hey, for those of you who are logging on, I'm trying a new uh, setup this morning. Can you hear me okay? Hello, Fide is it Fidelia? Make sure I'm saying it right. Hey, Judy. Y'all can, can y'all hear me okay? Hi, Inga. I'm using my uh, iPad for this, and I'll show you why uh, a little little later on. I'm try, trying something a little different. We'll give everybody a few moments. Hey, Justin. Uh, thanks for the backup, man. <laughs> hey, John and June, how are you? Um, hi, Esther. Hey, Jackie. Hi, Lou. So, uh, I have discovered that doing this on your iPad gives you a lot of other features. Hi, Jane. Um, that I want to try out, or I'm going to try out one thing today, and it does have a purpose. But I wasn't sure how this was going to work out. Hey, Sue. Hey, Candace. So uh, I'll do what I typically do and give everybody till about 12.03 to get on. And then we'll uh, get started, give people time to, to get on here. So is everybody doing okay? I know in Louisiana, the governor on Monday is supposed to uh, tell us whether or not we're going to be entering into phase one. I'll be interested to see how that works out. Hey, Van. Hey, Elba. And so I'm a little, I'm a, uh, excited about a return to somewhat normal. I'm a little nervous too. Hey, Cherry. Hey, Brant. Um, I'm still seeing reports from around the country of uh, COVID spreading. Still a lot of deaths. And so I'm, I'm excited but nervous. Hey, Kristen. Hi, Susan. I've heard uh, quite a few people say that uh, they're gonna they're gonna venture back out, but definitely wear masks. And then I've heard some from some other people who say they are not going to venture back out. Hey, Glenell. Hey, Don. So uh, this was in the notes, but if you're going to be reading along, we're going to be reading from uh, the Gospel of John, the 14th chapter. So if you have your Bibles. You can get those and open up to John 14. Hey, Jennifer. So also want to remind you all, hey, Laura, hey, Sylvia, if you are willing to do a start a watch party, and that will turn your page into, hey, Lou, We'll turn your page uh, into a broadcast and so other people can join in and watch us. Uh, it's a good way of uh, helping to share a little, little good news with people. And I hope I'm going to share some good news today. So maybe people need a little of that in their lives right now. Um, got a few more minutes. Or I guess I should say, I know that people have uh, need of good news right now. Yeah, uh... I, I, I want to make sure I'm saying your name right the right way. Is it Fidelia? I'm going to assume that's it. I'm going to ask a friend of mine who's a uh, Spanish speaker. But welcome, Fidelia. We're glad to have you. Hey, John. All right. But anyway, so I was saying some people are, are, are I'm hearing are, are going to venture back out. I've heard some people are going back to work. Their offices are opening back up. Uh, my name's Brady Fidelia. Uh, I'm the pastor at a Methodist church in Baton Rouge uh, in Louisiana. Hey, Colette. Um, I've heard some people who are returning to work. Um, and again, I've heard people who are definitely going to head back out but wear masks. And I just heard from someone this morning who said that he is not coming back out until uh, this. he feels very safe. Hi, Mary.
I don't know how many of you are familiar with, uh, there's a kind of a personal evaluation tool called the Clifton Strengths Finder. Hey, Chris. And uh, I have learning. Hey, Carlos. Good to see you, Carlos. I've missed you. Uh, anyway, so one of the things in the Clifton Strengths Finder is learner. So I've been, uh, I have a learner. I've been reading a lot and unfortunately been reading about the Spanish uh, flu and discovered it really lasted about two years and that the second wave was the worst part. So that's the bad part of my learner side. I read stuff like that. Hey Kay, how's, how's, uh, how's mommin going? Kay just had a new baby. Elliot, right? Am I remembering the name right? Hi Anita. All right, so I got 12.03, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. So again, wanna encourage you if you are willing to do a watch party to go ahead and do that. Um, so want to remind everybody that where I am getting the readings from is what is known as the Revised Common Lectionary. And uh, the lectionary is a, a series of readings that are uh, used by a lot of mainline Protestant churches. The uh, Roman Catholic Church also has a lectionary. The ones the Protestant use, Protestants use is a little different. Um, but it is, uh, it's, there, there are a lot of times they, they line up. And so one of the interesting things about following the lectionary is whenever you go to a church someplace, if they follow the lectionary, everybody's kind of doing the same readings. And it's an interesting thing that kind of ties us together uh, as Christians. So I put in your comments there um, the link to the lectionary site, because I know that people are looking for readings now while you're home and maybe not able to participate in Bible studies. And our reading for today is uh, from John 14, verses 1 through 14. Uh, I want to continue to make this resource available to you. Um, uh, BibleGateway.com. So this is where I do a lot of my study online and look a lot of things up online. It's just, I mean... Uh, I remember back in the day we had to use uh, Bible uh, study databases or programs. Uh, Don Cottrell, you'll remember that and how difficult it was with per with uh, websites like BibleGateway.com. I mean, you can search through the uh, internet very, very quickly. <laughs> Virginia wants to know if I'm backwards. I'm using my iPad today, so I don't know if that camera flips things or not. I'm always fascinated by that when I see people online. So I may be backwards, yes. Virginia would know. Um, anyway, so we're reading John 14, 1 through 14, and another thing I want to continue to remind us of is that we believe that the Bible is inspired by God, that it is God-breathed, and so when we read its words, uh, and when we read the stories, uh, we believe we will encounter God there if we'll listen with open hearts and with open spirits. So there is a prayer that we use called the Prayer of Illumination uh, before we read, and it is a prayer to invite God to speak to us through the Scriptures. And so uh, I put that in your notes, and I invite you to read with me or to pray with me that prayer. Let's pray. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and discussed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Amen. Okay, so John 14, 1 through 14. Uh, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God and believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Uh, if you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? 
The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. So this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So uh, there's a lot in this scripture. It always I, I find myself saying, man, how, so preaching is a very difficult thing to do because whenever we read scriptures like this, we just there's so many things available, um, di different things we can chase. So I just want to cover uh, one, one real quick thing. Well, maybe two real quick things, and then I want to get to the main uh, thing I want to talk about today with this scripture. So the beginning of this scripture is really a great uh, comfort to people. It's the part where he says, don't let your hearts be troubled. In my father's house, there are many dwelling places. Uh, if it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? Uh, this is often used during uh, funeral services, uh, and it's a great comfort. It's sort of Jesus's words uh, to his disciples. Uh, in John 14, Jesus is about to, uh, they're, they're, uh, they're in the midst of the, the Last Supper, and Jesus is about to be uh, arrested and beaten and crucified. So this is kind of near the end of uh, that story before we head towards the cross and, and resurrection. Um, and Jesus is telling his disciples, look, I'm, I'm going ahead of you to prepare a place for you. And so it's a great, great uh, scripture of comfort. Um, so uh, part of one of the interesting things in here is this language about uh, I go to prepare a place for you is language that is directly from first century Jewish marriage customs. And this is something that a groom would have said to his bride. And so uh, the way marriage worked then is there was uh, an engagement that basically happened. It was arranged between the father of the woman and the, and the, the groom or the, the fiance. They would make the arrangement. Uh, the, the, the groom would then go to the bride's house and there would be a ceremony there and uh, the ceremony would mark them as engaged and then the son would leave or the the, the husband would leave the husband-to-be would leave and when he left he would say I go to prepare a place for you and he would go back to his father's home and they would add a ha add a room onto the father's house uh, and the, the period of the engagement would last a year and so uh, then the son would go back, get the get the uh, his, his bride. They'd have the marriage ceremony, and then they would move together to live in the father's house. And this is this is where Jesus's language is coming from. I go to prepare a place for you, and I will come, and I will bring you to myself. And so it's really a very beautiful, intimate language that his disciples would have heard in a way that we really don't. So if you can imagine that kind of intimacy between a husband and a wife there. So uh, that's that beginning part. So in verse six. Uh, you know, they, they say to him, Jesus, well, how do we know the way? Uh, in verse 6, Jesus gives them the answer, and he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. And uh, that's a whole other thing that I, we could chase. I covered that in uh, the Bible study that I did last week, covered a little bit of this question about, is Jesus the only way? Uh, are people who don't follow Jesus uh, automatically damned or are they out with God or, you know, and so I'm not going to cover that again today, but I did put the link to last week's Bible study in your uh, notes there if you want to uh, look at that. So what I really want to focus on, this is the danger of preaching. I'm uh, seven minutes into this and I'm getting to what I'm really going to focus on. So what I really want to focus on uh, happens in verses eight and 10. So this is where Philip says this. He says, Philip, uh, or Philip says to him, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. And Jesus says to him, Philip, have I been with you all this time and you don't know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Uh, how can you say, show us the Father? I mean, uh, do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? So uh, this is a, a part of the Christian faith that I think we all have to wrestle with at some point in time and make peace with on some level. It's this idea that Jesus is God. So uh, I love to tell the story. I was driving home from church one Sunday morning with uh, one of my kids, and uh, it was my, my daughter Zoe, and she asked me the question. She said, Daddy, so we believe in Jesus, 
the way that Muslims believe in Muhammad, right? We kind of had this kind of the same idea. And I said, well, in some ways, I said, except we believe that Jesus is God. And she got this very, very puzzled look on her face. And she said, what? She said, no, we don't. She said, we believe Jesus is the son of God. And so I started talking to her about the Trinity and I sort of explained to her that, no, when we say Jesus is the son of God, we're saying that Jesus is God, that Jesus, uh, that, that the father and the son are one, right? That's part of this under, Trinitarian understanding. And uh, I thought it was funny. Zoe said to me, well, daddy, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. And, and she had gone to church her whole life. And she was, you know, this was years ago. So she was probably 12 years old or something like that, maybe 11 or 12. Uh, and it was just beginning to dawn on her that what we believe as Christians is that Jesus is God. Uh, we use this word incarnate, in the flesh, that uh, Jesus is God in the flesh. And that's basically what Jesus is telling Philip here, right? Come on, don't you know? Like Philip says, show us the Father. Show us God the Father. And Jesus says, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you don't know me? Which is a pretty astonishing thing to say, really, if you think about it. I, I kind of get chills in the, thinking of that moment, right? So this, this idea that Jesus is God is a theme that is developed throughout the Gospel of John. Uh, so in the very beginning of the Gospel, uh, in John 1, verse 1, uh, John writes this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And uh, the Greek word that John is using here for word is this word logos. And, and uh, I don't have time to go into all of this, you'll just have to trust me that what John is talking about when he says the word, what he says when he's talking about the logos in Greek, is Jesus. So if we were to replace that word, uh, word, what he's saying is in the beginning uh, was Jesus, and Jesus was was with God, and Jesus was God. Um, now, if you want to get really technical about it, we might want to say in the beginning was the Son of God, and the Son of God was with God, and the Son of God was God. But it's all the same idea. I mean, uh, that Jesus is, is God. He's this third person of the Trinity. He's one of the persons of God. So uh, in John 10, 30, uh, John has Jesus say this even more directly, really, I think as directly as it's said anywhere in the Gospels. Uh, John 10, 30 says this, the Father and I are one. Okay. So uh, it, this, is, this is really kind of, uh, again, something I think that we as Christians have to make peace with. We believe that Jesus, the son of Mary, uh, was God in the flesh, God incarnate, okay? And again, this is the idea that uh, is being explored here in John 14 in verses 8 through 10, uh, where Jesus says, come on, I've been with you all this time. Don't, don't you know who I am? So uh, now some argue, I always have found this fascinating, some argue that the idea of Jesus' divinity was manufactured by the early church. So this was not something Jesus himself taught. I think some people just have a hard time wrapping their minds around this, and so they try to rationalize, right? And they say, well, Jesus couldn't really have believed he was God, right? But uh, so the church, the church made this up. Uh, now, the Gospel of John, to be fair, is the latest of all the Gospels in terms of when it was written. It was most likely written in the 90s, okay? Um, so if Jesus was born somewhere around zero, some people say four, some people say six BC, but, uh, if Jesus was born somewhere around zero, nine, 90, you know, talking close to a hundred years later. And so did the idea develop in that hundred years that Jesus, uh, was divine? You know, was he just this Jewish rabbi who people were really amazed by, uh, but this idea developed that he was divine over years? Um, and, and I think if you wanted to argue, uh, from the gospel of John, you could say, well, it was a hundred years later. Maybe somebody somebody could think that, okay? But the, the problem with that argument is the earliest New Testament writings also contain this thinking about Jesus as God. So uh, the earliest writings we have are the writings of Paul, the earliest New Testament writings, okay? Uh, and Philippians, uh, which is one of Paul's letters, is one of the early ones. And so uh, some people think, I think consensus is it was written in the 50s, okay? So you got to do, I always ask people to do a little math with me on this. So if Philippians was written in the 50s, Jesus was born in zero or so, uh, died in 30, 33, okay? Um, and Paul is writing this in the 50s. So somebody do the math. How many years is that? Uh, 30s to 50s, let's call it 20 years, okay? Um, so 
in 20 years, uh, 20 years after Jesus' death, Paul wrote these words in Philippians 2. Uh, this is Philippians 2, 5 through 8. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited. Okay? So what Paul's saying here, and this is a whole other Bible study, but what Paul is saying here is uh, Jesus is equal to God. God and Jesus are equal. Okay? This is 20 years after Jesus, is, Jesus died. Okay? Um, so... Do you think 20, uh, so 20 years from now, I'll, I'll turn 50 this year, so 20 years from now, let's say 70, if I live that long, do you think that uh, my friends and my family are going to accidentally develop the idea or create the idea that Brady was God? Uh, I promise you they will not, <laughs> right? Um, so uh, it's, it's just not logical to think that 20 years after uh, somebody lived that people have kind of created, you know, they, they've so fantasized about who this person was that they've made up this idea that he was God. Uh, especially when the writings that we have say that Jesus himself said that he was God. So it's not like we have uh, this really great guy who taught lots of great stuff uh, and never said he was uh, divine or anything special. And then 100 years later, we made that up about him. Uh, the Christian writings, 20 years after his death, they're already saying that he was God. And they have him claiming this about himself. Okay. So I could give other examples for that, but I just think, uh, you know, uh, this is something that we have to accept and wrestle with as Christian people, this claim that Jesus is divine. Jesus is God. We got to, we got to make peace with it somehow. Um, so uh, I could give lots of other examples of that, but the divinity of Christ this is what I want to get to. The divinity of Christ is at the heart of the Christian message. Without the divinity of Christ, the whole thing falls apart. The whole thing falls apart. Um, and I, and I, I wrote in my notes over the last couple of days that we would explore why. Why is the divinity of Christ so important? Okay. Now, I only have time to give you one line of reasoning about this, and there are many. Okay. So here's the line of reasoning. Uh, and this is a, sort of a little bit, uh, is a version of what's known as the Christus Victor argument. I'm going to write that in your notes because those are, these, this is Latin, uh, Christus Victor, okay? Uh, oh, <laughs> it tagged somebody. Christus Victor, it's that name, Victor. I don't want to tag anybody. All right, there it is. So Christus Victor, the, vic the victory of Christ, right? So uh, here's the thing we have to start, the starting place for this thinking is we have to believe and we have to understand that humanity is lost and broken, okay? And this is not an indictment against humanity. It, it may be a little bit. It's not an indictment. It's just a description of reality, right? And I think any of us, if we look around the world around us and we look in our own lives, it shouldn't be very hard for us to uh, agree with this idea that, that somehow we're lost and we're broken, and the thing that uh, is really frustrating about that is that we know we're lost and we're broken. Uh, there is something inside of us that knows um, that uh, we are not what we are supposed to be and that the world is not the way that it is supposed to be and that life is not the way that it's supposed to be. And so uh, we experience this brokenness within ourselves. Um, another part about uh, human brokenness is that it's not just something that affects us. Uh, Christ, the Christian understanding is that this affects all of creation. So human brokenness has become the broken the creation's brokenness. And the, probably the most contemporary example of that I can give you is Chernobyl. I don't know how many, of you, how many of you watched the HBO special Chernobyl. And I'm not picking on the Russians. They're human like the rest of us. But there was just some particularly terrible things that happened in that whole uh, incident. But as a result of human decision-making, um, we... Uh, uh, how do I want to say it? We, we broke things on an atomic level, right? Um, and animals suffered because of that, and plants suffered because of that. And, you know, I just think we have this uh, incredible power as, as humans uh, to just do amazing things, and we can do amazingly destructive things that affect not just us, but they affect uh, the natural order of things. And so with the fallenness of humanity, all of creation is fallen, okay? This is this idea of Christian thinking, right? Uh, another interesting idea about this fallenness of humanity 
is none of us are innocent of it. Okay. So if you, if you think about this for a second, uh, so ha I have wronged people in my life. I have hurt people. I have injured people. I, I still do at times. Um, now I can say, well, the reason I behave that way or the reason I act that way is because other people hurt and injured me, which is true, right? Um, but at, at some point in time, uh, we have to get to the point, the, the way I like to say this is we are all victims of human brokenness, every single one of us. But because we are victims of it, um, all of us are also perpetrators of it. Uh, one of my favorite lines is broken people uh, or hurt, hurting people hurt people. It's just kind of the way it is. You know, I wish it wasn't, but it's kind of the way it is. So hurting people hurt people, right? So uh, we might ask the question, where did all this brokenness start? Um, the biblical answer, if you go back to the kind of the Adam and Eve story, the the biblical answer is it started at the very beginning. I mean, like on day one, like, you know, there was, there's just something broken about us anyway. Okay, so here's the question. So there's kind of the setup, right? Uh, and the question we're asking is, why is Jesus's divinity important? Why, why does Jesus have to be divine? And without Jesus's divinity, the whole kind of thing falls apart, right? So, uh, so we've got this, this uh, human state that we find ourselves in, this fallen state, this broken state. We're all a part of it. We're created, the created order is a part of this brokenness. Is there any hope? That's the question. Is there any hope for us? And the answer uh, is really this. Without outside intervention, the answer is no, there is no hope. Uh, because we are all broken. Like I've just, I've learned to kind of see this idea of sin and brokenness as a, it's a web that we're a part of. And, uh, you know, it, it, have you ever had somebody, and maybe you've done it yourself, you know, think that they're really trying to help you and have the best of intentions and they really end up hurting and harming, right? So even, you know, broke the, again, hurting people hurt people, right? So even, oh, well, I think I've got the, I've got the best intentions here. I'm going to try to help so-and-so and what I end up doing is hurting them, right? And so because we are broken and fallen, uh, we don't have the capacity to help others. We can do little nice things here and there, but but we don't really have the capacity to fix this kind of broken web that we live in. Uh, sometimes our attempts to fix, break it more, right? Um, and uh, so we can do good. We can do little good things here and there. But can we fix this deep, inherent human brokenness by ourselves? No, because we ourselves are broken. So here's the deal, though. So without outside intervention, we're lost. But here's the thing. Uh, we believe in God. I believe in God. Uh, I believe that uh, God is perfect, God is perfectly good. God is perfectly compassionate. God is perfectly powerful. And uh, you'd have to ask the question, can a good being, morally good, loving, compassionate being, stand back and watch other people suffer and do nothing? Uh, and the answer is no. If that being is good and perfect, no, that being can't sit and do nothing. And so therefore, God must intervene. If there is a God, listen to me, God must intervene. No option. Otherwise, God's not the good and perfect being that we uh, believe in. So here's the here's the beginning of the Christian story, or you know, the beginning of the maybe the Jesus story is God does intervene. God comes in the person of Jesus Christ, um, and Jesus faces the brokenness of the world. Jesus faces human sin. Jesus faces death, uh, which is, by the way, the ultimate. Uh, uh, brokenness in the world, death. Uh, Jesus faces all these things, and he is victorious. That's this Christus victor, Christ the victor. Jesus defeats them, uh, and Jesus is our champion in that regard, right? But here's what I wanted to do. Here's why I've, I've done this whole setup with my iPad that you probably don't aren't, aren't even aware of. So I am going to try to draw on this iPad. It's going to take me a minute. <laughs> All right, that's not the button I wanted to hit. I'm going to try to get out of that. <laughs> so this is what I want to avoid. So for some reason, this turns me green. But I can fix that by doing this. <laughs> that's not the one I want to hit. Okay, there it is. I'm not green anymore. Okay, so here's what I wanted to draw. So this whole idea of Christus Victor and Jesus' divinity. So uh, the idea in Christian thinking is that uh, Jesus descends, right? And this is actually contained in the uh, Apostles' Creed. So we have God up here, right? 
And so we say in the beginning of the Apostles' Creed, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was uh, born of the Virgin Mary, right? So the, the birth of Jesus starts what's known as the descent, okay? And this is what Paul talks about in Philippians 2, that he emptied himself of his, of his divinity. Uh, so he descends, he's born, he takes on human form, he descends, and uh, wh while he lives on the earth, he faces all of the brokenness that you and I face. He faces temptation, he faces human evil, he faces betrayal, he faces physical suffering, and ultimately he faces death itself, right? So this is this descent. Um, and uh, so uh, he was born of the Virgin Mary, he suffers under Pontius Pilate, He's crucified, we'll put the cross somewhere around here, okay, he's crucified, dead, and buried, okay, so this is the, this is the sort of, uh, again, this descent of Jesus from, from his uh, equality with God down to the sort of the human, human level. I like uh, the uh, traditional Christian teaching that Jesus descends into hell, okay, so if you want to take this descent even further, he goes down into kind of the, ne the nether world there, uh, where he faces uh, really what we would consider to be the, the deepest, darkest part of created brokenness, okay? Uh, but then we're told, so he, uh, he uh, is crucified, dead, buried, he descends into hell. The third day he uh, rises from the dead, right? So this is the beginning of this ascent, uh, and uh, he, uh, third day he's raised from the dead, he ascends into heaven, he sit at the, and he sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. So he, Jesus returns up, back up here, uh, and is with God again, right? So um, there is only one being who is powerful enough and disentangled enough to do this work on the behalf of humanity, and that's God, Okay. And so uh, the, the, this whole idea, again, of Jesus' incarnate, God's incarnation in Jesus Christ, that God came in the flesh into the world, uh, it, all, it all kind of uh, like kind of reaches its climax here, where Jesus uh, fights every evil, every darkness. Uh, again, I, I, just, I try to imagine all that Jesus faced, uh, especially in that last week of his life, where he's betrayed by a dear friend, he's abandoned by his other friends, he experiences physical torture, he experiences humiliation, uh, the government is against him, the religious leaders are against him. Uh, it's just, it's, it's uh, every darkness that you can imagine. Um, and he is victorious over those things. Uh, he does not give in to the violence, he does not give in to the hatred, he continues to be uh, loving and forgiving, and he, he just, he, he wins. Right? And so I go back to this idea that Jesus is our champion, right? But the only person who can be our champion in the midst of this is God. Uh, another human being cannot do that work that Jesus had to do. So does this make sense? Um, we, we talk about this all day long. but So uh, now somebody may ask, and I think it's a good question, then where is this victory, Brady? So if 2,000 years ago Jesus won this victory, God came in the flesh, uh, and, he def and, he, and he faced darkness and sin and death and won, which is what we say as Christians, uh, where's the victory? And here's, here's the answer for you, okay? It's coming. It's coming, okay? Uh, I just was reading something yesterday that uh, it said this, that Jesus, uh, the Jesus event, which is what I call it, you, you, you really can't separate any of this stuff out. It's got to be Jesus' uh, birth, uh, Jesus's life, Jesus's teachings, Jesus's death, Jesus's resurrection, Jesus's ascension. It's the whole Jesus event, right? Uh, the Jesus event inflicted a mortal wound on evil, sin, and death. Okay? Now, look, I'm not a hunter, but uh, I know it's possible to, to shoot an animal, to shoot a large animal, and uh, have it kind of uh, go through the woods for a while, uh, and you've inflicted a mortal wound upon it, but maybe it's still running, and you kind of follow the blood trail, and you go to go to find the find the kill. Um, God inflicted a mortal wound upon evil, darkness, and death through the Jesus event, and uh, it is only a matter of time before God's victory is is finalized as well. That's our faith as Christians. Okay. So, uh, and, and the idea is when we say, hey, I believe in Jesus, 
what we're saying is we believe in this this whole sort of intervention of God. I call it a divine rescue operation. We believe in this intervention of God in human history and time. Uh, and we believe, if you get to Revelation 21, that there will come a time where there, there will be a new heaven and a new earth, and God's victory will be final. Okay, That's the Christian faith. It just is. And it, and it absolutely has at its heart this idea that Jesus was not just a man, but that he was divine. And if you take that out of the equation, uh, in my opinion, the whole thing falls apart. So if you believe that about Jesus, uh, and if you live that belief, uh, it will change you. It will change your life. It just will. And it has, it's changed people for 2,000 years. We ourselves become kind of rescued out of some of the brokenness, um, not by our own efforts or by our own energy, but because of our faith in Christ. So, all right, I've gone on way too long, but uh, this, is, this is important stuff. So uh, some questions. I saw that Lou asked uh, about if Jesus uh, uh, was God, why did he cry out to God from the cross? And there's a couple of, uh, couple of thoughts about that. Uh, the psalm that Jesus quotes there, I believe it's Psalm 22. Uh, if you read where he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? If you go all the way to the end of that, it actually becomes a psalm of celebration in God's presence. Some people believe Jesus was singing on the cross and that it was not actually a cry of abandonment. Um, however, on the at the same time, others would argue that no, it, it, that Jesus really did in his in his humanity, because we believe Jesus was he was God, but he was fully human. That in Jesus' humanity, he did come very close to experiencing this absolute feeling of abandonment from God, just like people do sometimes. Um, and so uh, there, there's this whole argument about, uh, and it's a fun one, we can have it sometime, Lou, or, or, or debate, discussion is probably a better word than argument, but about uh, what is the nature of, if Jesus is fully divine, how much of that divinity was still contained in his human form? And so Paul talks again, if we go back to Philippians 2, which we read earlier, that he emptied himself of his, some of his divinity. He, or he emptied, what Paul says is he emptied himself of his divinity. Okay. Um, and so Jesus is not omniscient while he's on the earth. He's not omnipotent while he's on the earth. He's not omnipresent while he's on the earth. So he does have some limitations. Um, so that's, that's one explanation of why Jesus uh, cries out on the cross, but it's a good question, Lou. So does, do people have other, other questions? And I'll go, I've gone, I've gone on for too long. I want to try to keep these uh, as brief as I can, but I'll go back. If y'all have other questions, put them in the comments and I'll go back and try to try my best to answer them. Um, so, uh, want to encourage you. We're going to, uh, worship together as First United Methodist Church in Baton Rouge on Sunday morning at 8 39, 45, 11 o'clock. Hope you'll join us there. And, uh, also, uh, share this study after I post it. Uh, I know, uh, there may be other people who are interested and I hope that you will come back and join us next Wednesday. We'll be here again. So, uh, happy Mother's Day on Sunday to all the mothers out there. And, uh, let's, let's pray together. Let's pray. Lord God, uh, we give you thanks for Jesus. Uh, we thank you that you are a God who uh, does not, will not, and cannot stand idly by while, uh, while we suffer. And yes, we recognize that we suffer from a lot of our own doing, a lot of our own choicing, but choices, but you are a God who intervenes, and you have intervened in the person of Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, help us to, to seek Jesus, to understand who Jesus is, to put our faith in Jesus and to allow that belief to transform, to change, and to save us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, everyone. Take it easy, and uh, I will uh, see you all soon. Be well. Be safe.